uh, the history of globalization, terrorism, and war, whatever it is that I call it. Um, last week, we started talking about uh, kind of the background of American foreign policy and uh, America's foray into the world, especially in 1898. I have a map here which just kind of talks, uh, goes into show some of the trade routes and the, and, the, and the territories gained. But you can see, you know, by the turn of the 20th century, the United States really has become a global economic power with economic interests clearly across the Atlantic, which have already existed, but now well into the Pacific too, acquiring territories, the Philippines and Hawaii, Wake Island. And of course, the long-term goal would be the markets of Japan and then especially China, which was the occasion for the open door notes, which I mentioned last week, and I'll talk more about certainly um, in the coming classes. That's going to be kind of a recurrent theme. What I finished with last week, and I want to just briefly talk about today before moving on to 20th century uh, stuff, is um, the resistance to this. Uh, we talked about the kind of great movers and shakers behind America's movement abroad in the 1890s. Remember, it's a time of great economic problems, overproduction, deflation, surplus capital. So there's a consensus of the need for markets, people like Mahan and Roosevelt and Wilson. But not everybody bought into that. There was already a tradition of anti-imperialism in the United States, and that's going to be a theme that we talk about, you know, with some regularity this semester as well. There, the major themes are going to be, you know, kind of we talked about last week, the contextual themes, this, you know, expansion and markets and wars, terrorism, mission, things like that. But there's also this kind of uh, uh, the aspect of the way it plays out at home, you know, kind of the implications of it at home with things like McCarthyism or the Patriot Act. And there's also going to be a long tradition of anti-imperialism, too. And I want to just talk a little bit about that up to 1898 very briefly, and then we'll move on. And I want to start with a, 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 a very interesting source, my, my favorite imperialist, actually, John Quincy Adams, who was the Secretary of State, who wrote, we talked about last week, what did John Quincy Adams write in 1823? Monroe Doctrine, right, which was a statement of, of empire, right? stay out of this continent, this belongs to us. However, just a couple years before that, in 1821, while giving a Fourth of July address, John Quincy Adams said, America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy. She is the well-wisher of the freedom and independence. She is the well-wisher of the freedom and independence of all. She is the champion and vindicator only of her own. Adams continued saying that if the United States would begin to intervene in other lands, this is his warning, she might become the dictatress of the world. She would no longer be the ruler of her own spirit. Uh, this is a very powerful warning from John Quincy Adams, America goes not abroad in search of monsters to destroy, has become a kind of a very famous oration used time and again, uh, actually quite a bit. It's kind of made a renaissance in the past year or so, uh, given uh, Bush intervention in, in, in uh, Middle Eastern uh, uh, territories. So we, we hear a lot about John Quincy Adams' warning about searching for monsters to destroy. America could become the dictatress of the world. She would no longer be the ruler of her own spirit. And this, I think, kind of forms the focus of anti-imperialist thought. Uh, in part, it's occasioned by the idea that it's wrong to go abroad and, and create harm and disarray in other lands. It's, it's just wrong. Uh, it's counterproductive. It leads to wars and instability. But a large measure of it uh, uh, argues that imperialism is wrong because it runs counter to our institutions and our ideologies and our beliefs. We lose control of our, over our own spirit. There's this idea, uh, which is still very popular today, uh, both on the far left and far right. People like Ralph Nader and Pat Buchanan both feel the same way, that the United States has Republican institutions, small r, not Republican Party institutions, that, it, that, it, that uh, people in the United States have control over their political lives, that we have a constitutional system and imperialism, empire, uh, uh, moving abroad, having a big standard army, runs contrary to this. We become an empire and then we cease being a republic. We lose our spirit. So this is a common thread that you're going to see uh, time and again. Uh, uh, John Quincy Adams said this in, in 1821. Uh, later, after he left, he became president after Secretary of State, and then he actually ran for and was elected to Congress. He's the only president to serve uh, after leaving the presidency in the Congress. And he became an anti-slavery advocate, if you've any, ever seen the movie um, The Amistad. John Quincy Adams has a major role in that. And also an anti-imperialist spokesman. 
And during the acquisition of Texas, which we briefly talked about last week, 1846, 1848, when the United States is fighting uh, the Mexican-American War, Adams opposed it. He said that the annexation of Texas would turn the U.S. into a conquering and warlike nation. Aggrandizement aggressive expansion. Aggrandizement will be its passion and policy. A military government, a large army, a costly navy, distant colonies and associate islands in every sea will follow in rapid succession. And this fear is something we're going to talk about again later on, especially in the Cold War after World War II, when the U.S. creates something called the National Security State. And you're going to have a lot of people talk about the garrison state, the National Security State, a large army, a military government, a kind of a militarized culture. And this is going to be a real fear. And again, not just of people who you would normally think were on the political left, but among people on the right. One of my uh, favorite favorite uh, uh, examples at that point will be Robert Taft, a very conservative Republican senator from Ohio. Um, in this period, in the 1840s, another senator from Ohio, Thomas Corwin, agreed with John Quincy Adams and he said Polk, James Polk, the president who was trying to take, who took Oregon and Texas and California, was a monarch. Polk was acting like a monarch, unilaterally going out and taking these lands. Uh, he said his cabinet was a court. It wasn't a democratic uh, a political system. It was like a monarch and a court, people just doing what they wanted. Uh, uh, one of my favorite quotes from Corwin, which is, again, appropriate, I think, in light of what we've heard about uh, uh, Bush's intervention into Iraq, was that the justifications for war in, in Texas, where there was this contrived uh, alleged attack by the Mexicans, uh, but uh, uh, Corwin called these justifications a feculent mass of misrepresentation. A feculent mass of misrepresentation. You kind of know what that means, right? It's kind of like the, the weapons of mass destruction or something like that. Corwin said, the desire to increase our territory has depraved our moral sense. And you hear this a lot in the 1840s. This is when, um, uh, you know, Thoreau writes the famous essay, Civil Disobedience, uh, when you have, you know, really a widespread opposition to the uh, conquest of Texas. Uh, Abraham Lincoln actually was a, an anti-war congressman uh, at the time. And then in the period after the Civil War, there's this real fear of American expansion. It's kind of an inexorable trend. We talked about it last week. Seward, uh, William Henry Seward, who's the Secretary of State, acquires Alaska. And then the U.S. becomes more involved abroad until, you know, in the 1890s, it kind of erupts, you know, in Hawaii, in Cuba, in the Philippines. And there was a great deal of opposition to that as well. Uh, one senator, a well-known anti-imperialist named George Hoare, said, the danger is that we are to be transformed from a republic founded on the Declaration of Independence into a vulgar, commonplace empire founded upon physical force. Um, William Jennings Bryan, name we'll talk about again uh, later, uh, uh, wrote uh, a famous essay, gave us a famous speech called The Paralyzing Influence of Imperialism. And it kind of uh, harkens to uh, uh, military profiteering stories from World War I, or even today when we talk about things like Halliburton or KBR. Uh, um, uh, William Jennings Bryan said that in, in 1900, the people who should be happiest were the ship owners who would bring trips to the who would bring troops to the Philippines and dead bodies back. She's so talking about war profiteering. Uh, the best known anti-imperialist of the time was actually uh, Mark Twain. Um, and I didn't touch this, so it kind of went out. Anyway. Um, Mark Twain uh, uh, was actually the head of something called the World Anti-Imperialist League, which was uh, an organization, uh, a global organization, but especially headquartered in the U.S., uh, to uh, oppose imperialism and was uh, deeply involved, especially in opposing the Philippines uh, uh, intervention by the United States, which we talked about last week. And uh, Twain, uh, uh, in his own way, wrote new lyrics to the Battle Hymn of the Republic based on this idea. He said, mine eyes have seen the orgy of the launching of the sword. He is searching out the hoardings where the stranger's wealth is stored. He has loosed his faithful lightning and, wo and with woe and death has scored. His lust is marching on. Twain talking about this need for, for, for acquiring wealth. Um, Twain actually, as a reporter, went to the Philippines and wrote these incredible stories about Emiliano Aguinaldo, um, comparing him to Joan of Arc and George Washington, uh, talking about um, Aguinaldo's uh, 
sorry about that. Talking about Aguinaldo's, uh, uh, you know, heroism and his patriotism and things like that. Uh, Twain also went off uh, quite frequently about missionaries. We talked about that last week, kind of Christian missionaries who were especially, uh, um, you know, uh, prevalent in Asia. And he said, uh, uh, Mark Twain, he's, he's a real smart ass. If you've ever read Twain, you know that. Twain said, I bring you the stately matron named Christendom returning bedraggled, besmirched, and dishonored from pirate raids in Xingdao, Manchuria, South Africa, and the Philippines, with her soul full of meanness, her pocket full of boodle, and her mouth full of pious hypocrisies. Okay, this is very popular. There are you know, thousands of adherents to the uh, World Anti-Imperialist League. Twain's essays on this are really quite popular. I mean, we're all familiar with Huck Finn and things like that, but Twain's political writing, she also wrote a novel called The Gilded Age, which is a phrase you've probably heard in survey history courses. Twain's political writings were quite popular too. Uh, in the end, however, Mark Twain represented you know, a minority view, anti-imperialism, although popular, uh, uh, although you know, very powerful, could not stem this tide of, of expansion and acquisition. Teddy Roosevelt, who was Secretary of the Navy at the time, kind of felt sorry for them. You know, he offered this kind of a pitiable approach. He said, uh, uh, they are men of a bygone age having to deal with facts of the present. And, uh, you know, in a sense, politically at least, Roosevelt kind of had, had nailed it. Uh, imperialism was, you know, kind of the, the inexorable wave of the future. And so, um, no matter how, you know, powerful or, or compelling or, or intelligent or even, you know, ethical or moral, some people believed Twain and Hoar and others who opposed their, uh, uh, Brian opposed imperialism were, uh, uh, the fact was that, 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 you know, history in a sense was on the side of those who would expand. And so um, at the turn of the century, then the U.S. is clearly on a path toward empire. And so we're going to um, move to the next part, which we'll talk about that. What we're going to do now is talk about um, especially U.S. policy and what today we'd call the third world, Latin America and Asia. Uh, talk a little bit about the, the people who do that. Okay? Uh, we're going to start with kind of the, the folks who were responsible for it. The, the, what I call the old boys network of imperialism. Just a very brief uh, discussion of some of the people who really were kind of the driving forces behind this. We did a little of that last week and I just want to add to it. Um, in the course of this semester, I will certainly talk about individuals. You can't avoid that. But at the same time, I don't think that individuals are determinative. I mean, uh, at the end of World War II, there's a big debate as, as to whether if Franklin Roosevelt had lived, whether everything would have been different. You know, this was, was the shift from Roosevelt to Truman really that critical? I don't think so. I don't think that history works that way. I think that you have these big systems and structures and that the people who occupy the positions of power in that, people I call part of the ruling class, tend to operate according to the, the, the demands and obligations and ideas that the class really brings with it. And so uh, uh, what I want to do here and what I'll be doing in the future when I talk about individuals like that is basically talk about what these class interests are thinking at the time. So uh, the individual, you know, I, I don't think is as critical. We'll talk about Vietnam, you know, Kennedy and Johnson and Nixon, who politically are all quite different, but all pretty much have the same view, view of the world, especially when it comes to international relations. Differences that you see politically at home and it could be an issue like you know welfare or or you know nowadays choice or or uh, uh, um, you know whatever those tend to fade when you're talking about global policies and so even today you know this is this will be shown in subsequent generations right but you know there's an election going on with John Kerry and George Bush if you look at the way they look at the world in Iraq or in Palestine or wherever there's hardly any difference so when I talk about these individuals, they represent something larger than a small political base. They actually represent, I think, the consensus of the ruling class. So after 1898, then the U.S. has embarked on this kind of inexorable path toward empire. And it's going to be a different kind of empire. We'll talk more about that. Open door empire, not traditional course of militarist empire for the most part. This empire is going to be based on this ideology of the open door, and it will lead to emergence, to America's emergence as, as a, if not the global power, uh, during the Great War, World War I. U.S. foreign policy was aggressive. It was economically motivated. The Spanish-American Filipino War um, gave America a real sense of strength, uh, but it also pointed out uh, greater needs. If the United States, if you saw that map, I don't want to put it back up earlier, 
uh, was going to expand trade into new areas of the world, it would need to develop the, the kind of structure, the infrastructure, to be a major commercial power. And if you're going to do that, what do you need? You need a big navy. We've talked about that before with regard to Alfred Thayer Mahan. Why do you need a big navy? Control the sea lanes, protect your commercial uh, interests, your commercial ships. In addition to that, um, and actually let me throw another map up here. Oh wait, I have a, I, there we go. Uh, if you're going to do that, you also need, if we could go to this for a minute, um, if you're going to trade from the United States to the Pacific, right now you have to go all the way through, okay, down through the tip of, of South America. What would make things much easier? A canal would, right? And so the United States is going to need an Isthmian Canal. We can keep that up here for a few minutes because I'm going to go back uh, to it. And so the U.S. is going to need a big navy. It's going to need uh, a, a, a canal. And it's going to have to become far more active in foreign affairs and foreign policy. Uh, and this is, you know, we talk about globalization at the end of the 20th century. This is globalization. And in fact, if you look at the data in terms of the number of businesses uh, moving abroad, the amount of trade, the growth in trade, uh, the, the expansion, the globalization of this period, the late 19th century, is, is far greater than anything we see in the late 20th century. So this is really a period of, of intense global interest for the United States. So I just want to briefly talk about some of the people involved in this. Teddy Roosevelt, very important. He's a president after McKinley. William McKinley is my favorite president. He was born in my hometown of Niles, Ohio, was, was killed in 1901, and Teddy Roosevelt takes over. Roosevelt was a, a, a historian. He wrote a, a fairly well-known book about the War of 1812, a, a military buff. He was a social Darwinist. He believed that the U.S. had the rough work of the world to do this kind of civilizing mission. He called for the proper policing of the world. Um, he believed in the white man's burden, that white people had this you know, kind of missionary responsibility to go out. And uh, he was a real advocate of white supremacy. He was a graduate of Harvard. William Howard Taft, president after TR, was a graduate of Yale. He was the governor general of the Philippines, secretary of war, and he will become well known with the idea of dollar diplomacy, which we're going to talk about, the idea that you send businessmen rather than soldiers uh, to do the, uh, the, the, the stuff of empire. Woodrow Wilson, president after Taft. Johns Hopkins, PhD in political science. We'll talk a lot more about Wilson. Had a really sophisticated view of kind of global international capitalism. So these guys are really critical. Secretaries of State in this period, John Hay, who wrote the Open Door Notes. He was Abraham Lincoln's secretary, graduate of Brown University, had uh, a commercial interest in, in, in Anglo-American relations. Uh, his successor, Elihu Root, it's a name you don't hear too much, Elihu Root. Uh, Elihu Root said that Teddy Roosevelt was the greatest conservative force for the protection of property and capital he had ever met. This is the view that they bring of the world, the ruling class. Conservative forces for property and capital. This is what government should do. All right? Uh, uh, and Elihu Root was a wealthy corporate lawyer who graduated from NYU Law. His successor, another great name, Philander Knox. Philander Knox was the Attorney General of the U.S. Before that, he had helped form the consortium that became U.S. Steel, and he was a big advocate of dollar diplomacy. Wilson's Secretary of State in World War I was Robert Lansing, who was the son-in-law of an ex-Vice President named John Foster. He was a graduate of Amherst. These people all believed, these men all believed in the connections and the coordination between the government and business. They had to work together. In 1907, Woodrow Wilson very candidly, very honestly wrote, concessions obtained by financiers must be safeguarded by ministers of state, even if the sovereignty of unwilling nations is outraged in the process. What's he mean by that? I'm going to say that again. It's, it's kind of highfalutin language. It's really kind of a simple, simple uh, idea. Concessions obtained by financiers must be safeguarded by ministers of state, even if the sovereignty of unwilling nations is outraged in the process. What's, what's he saying? Yeah. Business has to be protected by government. Business has to be protected by government. And you, you, if, you want to, if you want the world to hear, you can push on the thing. Uh, business has to be protected by government. And 
what if uh, the, the, the countries that you're directing your business to resist? What, what takes priority? Business does. So their sovereignty can be outraged by the needs of our financiers. He's being quite candid. There's no other way to interpret that. So this is really, you know, this is the way. And again, this isn't the kind of scandalous thing that he would, you know, this is something that he said publicly. This isn't some kind of thing that everybody would hush-hush about. Uh, uh, Mahan, uh, Alfred Thayer Mahan said that commerce was the energizer of material civilization. Civilization being equated with commerce. Teddy Roosevelt in a message in 1901 said, America has only just begun to assume that commanding position in the international business world which will be, believe will be more and more hers. Again, very candid about the way that they see the world. This is part of their kind of mission to take over commerce, to civilize the world uh, too. In addition to sending businessmen over, they send in groups like the missionaries, the YMCA and so forth to, to be what they call advanced agents of, of civilization. In fact, Taft, when Howard Taft said with regard to the Chinese, and this is again, how do you determine civilization? This is Taft saying, the more civilized they become, the Chinese, the more civilized they become, the more active their industries, the wealthier they become, and the better market they become for us. What is civilization? Civilization is markets. And you can see that start to take, take root. In 1900, American exports amounted to $1.5 billion. Um, by 1914, up to $2.5 billion. So 60% increase, I believe, or 67% increase. Exports to Latin America, an area we'll talk about soon. In 1900, $132 million. By 1914, $309 million, which is almost a threefold increase. By 1914, on the eve of the Great War, American investment abroad rose to $3.5 billion. It's a tremendous, tremendous amount. All right, so you can see now then that everything is in place, the structure is in place for the United States to become far more engaged in far more aggressive ways in the world. This is, this is globalization. And what is the consequence of globalization if done coercively? What do you think? What's the consequence of, of this? What do you think? War. War. It's going to be war. It's going to be conflict. You know, it's going to be intervention. And we're going to see that. And we're going to use some examples. We're going to use the examples of um, uh, uh, the Caribbean right now. Our lake, Mare Nostrum. It's an old, an old concept. The idea that certain areas of the world belong to you. And we'll keep these maps up and we can shoot to them in a minute. We don't, we don't have to do it yet. Throughout the, um, throughout the 19th century, the United States was interested in a canal. We talked about that before. Why? To facilitate trade so that you can just, you know, kind of cut through rather than have to go all the way down across the Atlantic through the southern tip of uh, South America. And so the U.S. had been working toward construction of a canal for some time. I'll go through this quickly. You don't have to worry about the, the details of it. In 1850, the Americans and the British actually had signed a treaty called the clayton Bulwer Treaty, which... Um, and I think it's, yeah, some of that's on the, uh, the terms down there if you want to look at them. Uh, the clayton Bulwer Treaty, uh, which said that the U.S. and Britain would jointly control any Isthmian Canal. Even though the Monroe Doctrine is in effect, the U.S. doesn't have the kind of power to kick the British out of uh, the New World. That had been one of the real fears when the U.S. took Mexico, took, went to war against Mexico for Texas, was that Britain would try to intervene and gain a foothold in Texas. And the U.S. feared that there would be the United States and that Texas would be controlled by the British and then you'd have Mexico. So there's this real fear of British interference in the New World. Uh, and the U.S. doesn't have the force to get rid of Britain altogether. So the, the uh, clayton Bulwer Treaty would have actually uh, allowed for joint control by the later 19th century. That's not really a concern. In 1900, Hay signed a treaty with the uh, uh, French foreign minister, the hay Possefort Treaty, which said that the U.S. could build but not fortify a canal. Okay, what's the difference there? What's the distinction? If you can build it but not fortify, what's the concern? The U.S. opposes this. Teddy Roosevelt rejected it. What is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, fortifying, it means you put your troops there and you control it, right? I mean, this isn't fortifying in the sense we want safety. It's, it's actual control. So Roosevelt rejected that, and the Senate defeated it. So a new treaty came up, which allowed for the U.S. not only to build the canal, but to fortify it. 
this is where it gets interesting. This is actually a pretty good story, and I have to go. I, I can't give it justice and go into a lot of detail because it's really kind of fun and intriguing with de with uh, bribes and backdoor payments and all kinds of stuff like that. But in 1901, a, a government engineering study said that the site of the canal ought to be in Nicaragua. Right? We all know where it ended up, right? But they said it should be in Nicaragua. Why? Because it's cheaper and more efficient than the other alternative, which was Panama. However, there was a French firm called the New Panama Canal Treaty, and that had the charter from Colombia. Now, keep in mind, and can we see this here, Panama and Colombia are not separate at the time. Panama is a part of Colombia. There is no independent Panama. All right? So Panama and Colombia are the same. Panama is a region in Colombia, and this French firm, the New Panama Canal, a uh, uh, company, which I think is on there, the New Panama Canal Company, had the charter from Colombia to build the canal, and they had the concession, and they wanted $109 million to build it, which was a, like two to three times more than the Nicaraguan Canal would cost. So when Congress voted, they voted to authorize a canal to be built in Nicaragua. However, the lawyer for the New Panama Canal Company was a man named William Cromwell. Uh, William Cromwell probably won't mean a whole lot to you, but some of you may have actually heard of a, a Washington, D.C. law firm called Sullivan and Cromwell. Anybody ever heard of that? You'll hear about it again. Sullivan and Cromwell is still to this day around. Sullivan and Cromwell defended, for instance, Oliver North during the Iran-Contra hearings. Okay? Sullivan and Cromwell uh, was afraid that the new Panama Canal Company would take a bath, so he swung into action. Allegedly, suitcases full of money were transferred at hotels in New York and all kinds of back door shady dealings were done and he began to talk to Teddy Roosevelt and all kinds of other government bigwigs and a French agent for the canal company Philippe Banalvaria so Cromwell and Banalvaria get together and they talk to all these Americans who have a great deal of influence over where the canal will be built and ironically the engineers have a change of heart they miss something I guess and 10 days later they come out with a new report that says no we were wrong Nicaragua isn't the best place to build a canal Panama is and allegedly 10 you know millions if not tens of millions of dollars changed hands uh, uh, as a result of this uh, and what would the price be initially the new Panama Canal Company said well we need at least 109 million the new price was 40 million so they dropped their asking price significantly in order to get this treaty. And this is after spreading some, you know, uh, jack around as well. So there's, there's, this is a real shady deal. Um, John Hay then negotiated with Colombia and signed a treaty giving Colombia $10 million up front and an annual payment of $250,000. Basically, this is rent, right, for Colombia's land. Something I forgot to mention last week, somebody asked me after class, uh, they asked about Guantanamo and the role of Guantanamo in Cuba. Uh, the U.S. did get access to Guantanamo after 1898 and actually still pays an annual rent. I forget what it is, like a thousand bucks or something like that to Cuba for it. So when you take foreign territories, you actually have to pay them for it. Castro never cashes the checks. He opens up his desk and there are all these like, checks there that the U.S. has sent for Guantanamo. So, but at any rate, that was the deal. Now, Colombia was happy with this $10 million payment, but they wanted more. So the Colombians went to the new Panama Canal Company and said, we want $10 million more. So they wanted $10 million, not just from the U.S. government, from the, from the Canal Company too. Cromwell and Hay decided that that's unfair, and they cried foul. These are the guys who got it by bribery, right? They cried foul, and Teddy Roosevelt was furious at the Colombians. He called them Dagos. Teddy Roosevelt had this kind of racial view of the world. So to Teddy Roosevelt, people were niggers or dagos or something like that. And he called the Colombians dagos. So Colombia said, okay, you don't want to pay us? They rejected the treaty. So after going through all this to get the, the canal changed from, from uh, 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 Nicaragua to Colombia, the Colombians said, screw you, you know, and they rejected the treaty. In Colombia, there was an independence movement led by the Panamanians. So the Panamanians were trying to break off from Colombia anyway. So guess what the United States did? It funded the Panamanian rebels, these freedom fighters who were trying to gain their national liberation from the oppressive Colombian government. Teddy Roosevelt sends warships to Colombia, okay, to support the Panamanian revolution. The U.S. is supporting freedom fighters. They're supporting the forces of liberalization and liberty. This is called gunboat diplomacy.
What does it do? It scares the hell out of the Colombian government. They bail. Okay? Teddy Roosevelt denies any U.S. involvement whatsoever, but the net result of it is that Panama becomes an independent state, an independent country. Okay, and what do they do? What do the Panamanians do as soon as they become independent? They, they cut a deal to build the canal. It begins construction in 1904. The United States ultimately paid $25 million to Panama. They called it canal alimony. Trying, trying to be clever. With the canal built, Teddy Roosevelt can now expand American imperium. Roosevelt said, the Monroe Doctrine is a guarantee of the commercial independence of the Americas. You, I mean, the, the Monroe Doctrine, it's three little lines. It's really easy to read, and it doesn't say anything about commerce, right? But Teddy Roosevelt said, it is a guarantee of the commercial independence of the Americas, globalization. Right? And you can start to see America's new aggression play out immediately. There was a crisis at this time in Venezuela. Venezuela, and you'll see this is a common theme we're going to talk about. Venezuela was in debt to German and British investors. Now, the Monroe Doctrine said, we don't want you intervening. We don't want you colonizing the New World. All right? Now, Teddy Roosevelt interprets this differently. Since there are German and British investors in Venezuela, Roosevelt doesn't like that. So Roosevelt fears this European investment, European intervention. Intervention, when we think of intervention, we think of troops and armies, right? Intervention could be bankers trying to, you know, invest in another country just as, just as much. And so intervention and, and investment really, you know, pretty much mean the same thing. Uh, so, so Roosevelt fears this German especially intervention in Colombia, and the Germans actually even sent troops to bombard Venezuelan forts. Roosevelt sent, in another case of gunboat diplomacy, uh, uh, Admiral Dewey, who had been in Manila a few years earlier, and, and the fleet to the Caribbean, okay? And the Germans and the British got the message, you know, don't mess with Teddy Roosevelt, so they resolved their issues, and they acquiesced in U.S. power in the Caribbean. The United States, as, and this is why I called it, um, Caribbean cops, the United States would exercise what Roosevelt called an international police power. Roosevelt sees the world as full of kind of scoff laws and unruly characters who need to be put in their place. And who's going to do that? Who's going to be the cop on the beat? It's the U.S. The U.S. is going to do it in the Caribbean. This will become known as the Roosevelt Corollary. It's something that, you know, you've probably all kind of heard about. Let me, um, see, there's, a, I think, a fairly decent map here. They kind of indicate some of this stuff. Uh, it's figures of Zacharbat. This, this is called the Roosevelt Corollary, this idea that the U.S. will police this area. This is, this is, this is good because, you know, you know, you get your information from various sources. The Roosevelt Corollary source I have, here we go, if, if you want to, you know, kind of get some sense of it, but um, no updates. <laughs> but uh, um, this is the kind of Caribbean. This is... You know, Roosevelt will see this as kind of an extension of the Monroe Doctrine, all of this area here. And not just in terms of what foreign countries can do, or where foreign countries can colonize, but in terms of commercial investment as well. And so the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine is going to say, we don't want anybody intervening anywhere. We will be the policemen on the beat. This is from the Department of State. This is the State Department's official website talking about the Roosevelt Corollary. And I want to read it because it's really interesting because, you know, there's really no way to put a kind of kinder, gentler face on the Roosevelt Corollary. Um, uh, 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 Roosevelt issues this speech in December of, of 1904. And he says that this is from the State Department's website. It says the U.S. will intervene to ensure that other nations in the Western Hemisphere fulfill their obligations to international creditors and did not violate the rights of the U.S. to invite foreign aggression to the detriment of the entire body of American nations. As the corollary worked out in practice, this is the Department of State, as the corollary worked out in practice, the U.S. increasingly used military force to restore internal stability to nations in the regions. Roosevelt declared that the U.S. might exercise international police power in flagrant cases of such wrongdoing or impotence over the long term the corollary had little to do with relations between the Western Hemisphere and Europe, but it did serve as justification for U.S. intervention in Cuba, Nicaragua, Haiti, and the Dominican Republic. This is from the Department of State talking about the Roosevelt Corollary. Roosevelt said, 
chronic, and this opens the floodgates to America's role in Latin America, to, to, to a more aggressive interventionist role in Latin America. It's, it's globalization, it's war, it's conflict uh, to the people involved. Uh, you know, uh, uh, having American uh, gunships bombard the coast certainly is terrifying, it's terrorizing too. So the floodgates are open. Roosevelt said, chronic wrongdoing or an impotence which results in a general loosening of the ties of civilized society may in America as elsewhere ultimately require intervention by some civilized nation and in the Western Hemisphere the adherence of the United States to the Monroe Doctrine may force the United States however reluctantly in the flagrant cases of such wrongdoing or impotence to the exercise of an international police power. The, the language is, you know, the, the civili civilization. If they, if they flaunt the rules of civilization, meaning allow foreigners to invest in that area, then the U.S. may exercise this international police power. Um, this was occasioned by several things, Venezuela won, but even more kind of contemporary at the time was a crisis in the Dominican Republic. Um, the Dominican Republic was... Um, the, the, build, the building of the Panama Canal, kind of go back a little bit, uh, uh, creates new obligations. Elihu Root said that the canal, uh, the effect of the canal must be to require us to police the surrounding premises. And um, the Dominican Republic is part of Hispaniola. You, you kind of know where it is. It shares an island with, with Haiti. Uh, the Dominican Republic was having some financial trouble and there was a fear that European countries would come in and try to kind of stabilize, meaning invest in or maybe even take control of the Dominican economy. So Elihu Root put DR Customs Houses, which collect and distribute revenue under U.S. receivership. What does this mean? Americans militarily went in to the Dominican Republic and took control of all the customs houses where they collect and distribute revenues. Now, a lot of Dominicans didn't like this because this is an assault on their sovereignty, right? So rebels in the Dominican Republic began to attack customs houses and even assassinated the president in 1911 because they considered him to be too close to the United States. So, and in, in, in chronologically, this is going to cover a long periods of time, don't worry about it. In 1912 then, American Marines intervened to restore order, which meant re-seize the customs houses. In 1913, Woodrow Wilson is now president, and the rebels are still attacking American institutions in the Dominican Republic. Wilson tries gunboat diplomacy, finally sends troops in to occupy the DR. Wilson then forces the leaders of the Dominican Republic to sign a new treaty which gives the United States full control over all DR resources, customs houses, trade, and so forth, okay? And establishes a formal military occupation. Remember what Wilson had said? That if the rights of financiers are being restricted, then we have the right to do what we do, even if the sovereignty of other countries is outraged in the process. Clearly, what level of sovereignty does the Dominicans have by the time Wilson is done? It's none. Their customs houses are seized, their revenue is being controlled by the U.S., the U.S. occupies militarily the Dominican Republic. Okay, next case, next door, Haiti, Saint-Domingue becomes Haiti. The U.S. didn't have a great deal of interest in Haiti. Um, it had limited investments, and Haiti's still today probably the poorest country in the world, one of the poorest in the world. The U.S. had limited investments in Haiti, a small railway, and about a third interest in the Haitian National Bank. But the bank was mostly owned by British, I'm sorry, French and German investors. And this is a concern per the, the corollary, right? Commercial restrictions. So, um, the, uh, 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 the, Brit uh, the, the Germans and the French have the, the controlling interest in uh, uh, the National Bank of Haiti. Haiti is in disarray. There is an uprising there. The Americans fear that if this kind of instability continues, what might the Germans and French do? Send, send troops in because they would have to protect their bank, right? Their interests, their investments. Right? So the United States fears this, and this is really, you know, right at the at the uh, at the outset of World War 
uh, uh, won as well. So, you know, Germany is kind of this upstart colonial power. Everybody's afraid of no matter what. So Woodrow Wilson, just as the U.S. had done in the Dominican Republic, pushes for customs receivership. He wants to do the same thing. The Haitians resist. There's political violence. Wilson finally sends 2,000 Marines in and takes over, just as in the DR, total financial control and political control of Haiti. The U.S. has no real interests, financial interests. Haiti, as I said, is very, very poor and very small. Uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, later bragged that he had gone to Haiti and written their constitution for them. The U.S. told them how to write their constitution. Uh, one of, I think, the most telling anecdotes about this period, actually, though, which talks about the kind of contempt and, and lack of interest that the U.S. has in the countries upon which it's acting comes from William Jennings Bryan. Now, William Jennings Bryan has a decent reputation, and we'll talk about some of the stuff he did. William Jennings Bryan was Secretary of State. He goes down to a meeting in Haiti with some of the Haitian officials and walks out and turns to a friend and says, nigger speak in French, don't that beat all? And this is kind of the contempt the U.S. has for this part of the world. They don't, you know, just like a, a total lack of interest in any, in a, you know, indigenous culture or their interest or, or their sovereignty or anything like that. So the U.S., as it had done in the Dominican Republic, takes Haiti, Nicaragua, okay? talked about Reagan at the beginning of class before class began. Nicaragua will come back to, to haunt this in the, in the 80s, but the U.S. experience in Nicaragua didn't begin in the Reagan years. Um, Nicaragua was, remember, bypassed as, as the canal location, but it was still a key spot. And the Nicaraguans were upset, as you can imagine. They, they believed that they had been you know, cheated out of this canal, which would have been great for, for their own revenue, for at least the Nicaraguan elites at least. The president of Nicaragua was a guy named Jose Zelaya, and he, upset at the United States, began to solicit foreign investment. You know, the country has to develop, so he goes looking for other people to invest, and uh, uh, um, including the Germans. Now, we've already talked about Germany with relation to the Dominican Republic and Venezuela and Haiti. The Germans were getting more involved in Latin America in this period. And Zelaya wanted to find another country to bankroll what? Another canal. He wanted to build a second canal. The U.S., however, said that Zelaya was an enemy. That's the, that's the word that the State Department used. Zelaya is an enemy of American interests, of American business interests. Why? Because he wants to build another canal. We already got the canal. We own it. We control it. We don't need a competitor canal in, uh, in that region, right? So uh, the U.S. is upset at the Nicaraguan government. In addition to that, uh, Zelaya found two Americans in Nicaragua who had joined an army trying to overthrow him, so he executed them, foreign nationals trying to overthrow the government. That's pretty much par for the course. So the U.S. breaks off diplomatic relations with Nicaragua, threatens Navy intervention, and Zelaya flees. He bolts. Okay? So the United States puts into power its own man a guy named Adolfo Diaz, and the Secretary of State, Philander Knox, goes to Diaz and writes a treaty, which gives the U.S. control over the customs houses, the customs services, revenues, and so forth. The U.S. Senate was, I mean, it was just so blatant, even the U.S. Senate couldn't swallow it, and they refused to uh, 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 ratify this treaty. So Taft and then Wilson took the easy way out. They sent in the Marines. Uh, they sent in a Marine general to lead this expedition, a guy named Smedley Butler. And I'm just going to throw that out there because we're going to talk about Butler later. He's a very colorful character. But Smedley Butler leads this intervention into Nicaragua on behalf of the Diaz regime and on behalf of American banking interests. And Nicaragua is taken over by the United States. In the 20s, this uprising gained steam, and it was led by a man named Cesar Augusto Sandino, uh, S-A-N-D-I-N-O. That name, again, will become familiar in the 80s. Why? What was the government of Nicaragua called in the 80s? Sandinista. It was named after Sandino. He was a freedom fighter, finally hunted down and killed by the U.S. Marines in the late 20s. So, in these cases, Dominican Republic, Haiti, you know, Panama and Colombia before that, Nicaragua, the United States intervenes to uh, limit, restrict, or actually take control of the sovereignty of these countries as part of this globalizing mission. Why did they do it in each case to protect American investments and just as importantly to keep foreign investments out of this area because this is our lake, this is our area. The Monroe Doctrine and the Roosevelt Corollary will apply. Probably the best example though, the place where it um, 
you know you would know the most about it would be in Mexico. Um, the Mexicans had been uh, underneath the, the, the uh, what, what they called the Porfiriato, the rule of Porfirio, Di Porfirio Diaz from 1876 to I think 1910, Diaz died. He was ousted, uh, uh, no I'm sorry, he was actually overthrown and died shortly after, ousted by uh, a some, somewhat of a liberal named Francisco Madero. Um, the United States, you know, everyone knew that Diaz was not a nice guy, but the U.S. always did well with Diaz. Uh, Americans, U.S. nationals controlled over half of Mexican property, and Mexico was the world's third biggest oil producer, and who controlled Mexican oil? The Americans did. Uh, Standard Oil, Texaco, and the Mexican Petroleum Company, which was owned by a particularly kind of nasty guy named Edward Doheny. So the Americans controlled all the oil, almost all the oil in Mexico, and owned over half the land. At one point in the later 20th century, the biggest landholder in Mexico, Cuba, and Texas was the same man. Richard Kleiberg, who owns the King Ranch in Texas, was also the biggest landholder in both Cuba and Mexico. So these guys uh, are all over. There's a great deal of Mormon land in Mexico. Actually, Orrin Hatch, the guy who's senator from Utah, his family was a big landholder in Mexico. So there was a lot of American interest, a lot of American banking interest, Citibank. Uh, uh, James Stillman, who was the head of Citibank, had great interest in Mexico. John Hart, who teaches here, has written a wonderful book on that called Revolutionary Mexico, if you're interested in it. It's the best book by far on this. Um, so uh, uh, the Americans, you know, uh, have a great stake in Mexico. Madero is a nationalist. Now the rhetoric of America, you know, liberalizing and freedom and all that, would indicate that they would like that. However, um, the United States is suspicious of him. So with the deep involvement of American business and government interests, Madero is overthrown by a general named Victoriano Huerta, who killed Madero in 1913. And on the outline, I have the names of these people. You don't have to know them, but just if you're interested, you know, Diaz. It's like a lineup of five or six different leaders in a very short period of time. So Huerta kills Madero, but before William Howard Taft could recognize the new Huerta government, well, Huerta's a strong man. He's kind of in the Diaz mold. Huerta, however, is challenged by a governor from the north named Venustiano Carranza. And again, this is all detailed. You don't have to know the blow-by-blow -blow of it. Carranza then goes after Huerta, and so the U.S. is caught in the crossfire. The U.S. would prefer Huerta, this is while Taft is still president, but at the same time, Carranza has a great deal of popular following. So Taft holds off on recognition. He wants Huerta to establish order. He wants Huerta to punish Carranza's people when they attack Americans, and he wants to end discriminations against American interests. And what do you think that means? Discriminations against American interests? Trade and investment, all right? So the U.S. likes Huerta, but Woodrow Wilson becomes president, and Wilson has a different view. He's kind of upset by Huerta's murder of Madero, so he refuses to recognize him. Wilson actually sends government officials to demand that Huerta leave office and he says we want you to have elections then we will approve of them. So what, what's Wilson trying to do in Mexico? What he just done in Dominican Republic and Haiti and everywhere else, right? Saying we want to take over. Well, you'll have elections but they won't be legitimate until we approve of them. Now what Wilson does is basically unite everybody in Mexico against the U.S. Both Huerta, the, Huerta, the Huertistas and the Carancistas uh, uh, both don't want the U.S. in. So uh, Wilson um, uh, goes to, to Huerta and tells him this is what he wants. Then he goes to Carranza and Carranza tells him to get lost as well. Both Carranza and Huerta, although they were involved in a civil war against each other, were nationalists and neither wanted the U.S. coming in and telling him what to do. Wilson said his policy was to isolate General Huerta entirely and so to force him out. It was funny, you know, last year they kept talking about this is a new trend in American foreign policy, regime change. The U.S. is intervening simply to get rid of Saddam Hussein. What is Wilson saying? What is his policy? To isolate General Huerta entirely and so to force him out. If that isn't regime change, what is it? Right? Wilson says, if the pressure we use on Huerta fails, then it will become the duty of the United States to use less peaceful means to put him out. So what is Wilson saying? He's basically saying, leave or else we will intervene to get rid of you. 
Wilson had also established an arms embargo. However, he lifted that in February of 1914. And in so doing, arms begin flowing into Mexico, and the U.S. essentially decides who will win the Mexican Revolution, which is taking place at the time. Wilson also sent forces to Tampico, which is here on the coast and which is a, a big oil town on the Gulf. Where does troops in Tampico arrested American sailors and Wilson, that was just what Wilson wanted. So he then goes to Congress and asks for approval to intervene and sends troops in April of 1914 down to Veracruz. In Veracruz, guess who makes another appearance? The Germans. German troops were going to Veracruz to deliver arms to Huerta. The Americans get there and occupy Veracruz and uh, 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 prevent these arms shipments from going to Huerta. At the same time, arms are flowing in to the Carancistas. Again, Wilson had overplayed his hands, and what he had done was actually united Mexicans behind Huerta. Huerta wasn't popular, but the fact that the U.S. was trying to get rid of him gave him standing, much like Saddam Hussein was able to use that throughout the entire sanctions regime period. Saddam's popularity was based only on the fact that the Americans were trying to uh, get rid of him and that he had stood up to them. So generally, when you know, quite often it has this you know, kind of opposite effect. The U.S. tries to get rid of these governments, but what it does is give them national standing by standing up to the Americans, and that's clearly what it happened to, to, uh, to in Mexico, as Wilson tries to get rid of, rid of Huerta, a lot of Mexicans begin to join the army, and he becomes more popular. So Wilson can't do these threats against him like he had been doing. He has to actually go to mediation, and where it is essentially paid off and bolts, goes to Europe, and Carranza takes over in August of 1914. Everything's cool, right? Except Carranza, what does he do next? He announces plans for agrarian reform and he claims all subsoil mineral rights for Mexican nationals. Think of that. What does that mean, subsoil mineral rights? Oil. Carranza says the oil belongs to Mexicans. All right? So, Wilson, after going through all this effort to get rid of Huerta, now has a president who wants to do land reform and who owns most of the land in Mexico? And who wants to claim oil rights? And who owns the oil in Mexico? The U.S. does. So, I mean, this is, this is not good, right? So, Wilson refuses to recognize Carranza and even begins to arm Pancho Villa. And we all know, you know, a little bit about Pancho Villa, right? And that's not going to work because Pancho Villa is this Robin Hood character. You know, Villa and Zapata are, are, you know, championing the people, the peasants, you know. So, this is really a disaster. So, this Carranza Villa conflict continues. The U.S. oil companies back, who can they back against Villa? They have to back Carranza, right? So Carranza's announced that he wants to take over these subsoil mineral rights, but at the same time, the oil companies have to support him. Villa was furious at Carranza because he said he was a vassal of the United States. And to take out his anger, Villa actually even crossed into New Mexico and attacked an American encampment, uh, 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 American soldiers, and then was chased back into Mexico by Blackjack Pershing. So um, never found him, never found him. So, what, what was the net result of the U.S. intervention? It was provoked uh, uh, by Huerta, refusal to leave. The U.S. then gets in Carranza, who does the opposite of what Wilson wanted, which was to claim mineral and land rights for the Mexicans. And this, in turn, is really great for Villa's popularity, okay? So, Wilson is really beside himself. He's ready to go to war. Woodrow Wilson is essentially preparing to go to war against Mexico. However, uh, the European war is flaring up at this time, and the American people aren't terribly thrilled about this either. So the net result of it is in 1917, Mexico adopted a new constitution which did include land reform, and Carranza was elected president. Okay? So sometimes it works out, sometimes not as well. The U.S. still had huge influence in Mexico, and by no means do I mean they were like thrown out in 1917, but it couldn't do in Mexico what it had done in Haiti and the Dominican Republic and, uh, and in Nicaragua, um, though it certainly tried. At the same time, though, we can kind of see, you know, where this globalization takes it, all right? Whether it be the customs houses, banking interest, land, oil, I mean, oil, this is, you know, in many ways the first major blow up, the first major global conflict in which oil played such a major role. You know, oil, oil uh, uh, interests in, in Mexico.
in all of these cases, the U.S. is on this globalizing mission, this liberal imperial mission to find markets, to pursue the open door. But when the countries upon which you're acting don't have the same vision and the same view, liberalism becomes coercive, doesn't it? I mean, wouldn't the open door, if, if you believe in an open door, then wouldn't the Germans and the French have rights to the Haitian bank investment? Wouldn't they be able to subscribe in the Haitian bank? Well, no, because the Monroe Doctrine or the Roosevelt Corollary applies, and that trumps that, right? So it's an open door in places where we're not already established, like China, but in places where we already have control, like the Dominican Republic or like Haiti or like Colombia, then the open door doesn't apply. If Nicaragua wants to build another canal with German capital, we can't allow that to happen because that would compete with the canal that we built with American bribery capital in Panama, all right? What's the net result of this for the people impacted upon? They get American intervention. They usually rise up. You have rebellions in Haiti, in the Dominican Republic, in Nicaragua. And what's the result of that? Well, I think the people impacted upon would you know, call it terrorism. I mean, when you know, the American Marines come in and hunt down rebels and kill their leader, as they did in Nicaragua, says Augusto Sandino, then clearly you know, that, that indicates something. And in the 80s, when we get toward the end of the course, we'll talk about Nicaragua in the 80s, and they're going to make reference to this all the time. I mean, the government's called the Sandinista government. You know, that sense of history really, you know, really is, is vital to them. So, so from 1898 and just a, you know, a generation after that, you can see the U.S. moving abroad very rapidly, very aggressively, first in its own backyard in the Caribbean and Latin America. Okay? Another area just as important, though, is going to be um, in Asia. And especially, you know, we'll see that, uh, you know, December 7th, 1941. Everybody knows what happened. What happened on December 7th, 1941? Pearl Harbor. Why? I mean, did the, the Japanese just woke up and have nothing better to do, so they decided to blow up some American ships? No, of course not. That's not the way history works. So, uh, 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 the attack on Pearl Harbor, World War II in the Pacific, is the culmination of a long period of conflict, of competition between the United States and other nations, especially Japan, for getting a commercial foothold in the Pacific, in Asia. And so I want to talk about this. Okay. Two major things going on in Asia, and it will be this way throughout the entire century. It's going to be Japan's emergence, Japan's growth, Japan's power, and of course the so-called China market. All right. Uh, 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 the open door notes in 1898 were directed at China, and just a few days ago there was a big story in the paper, which I sent out on the list. General Motors is investing $3 billion where? In China. It's the same thing. So when you talk about China, when you talk about Japan, the rhetoric and the ideas are very similar to what they were in 1904 or 1894 than what they are today. Markets, mission, you know, redemption. It's the biggest country in the world in China, and Japan is the, uh, uh, the country that's going to kind of contain China, and Japan has an emerging powerful economy. So you kind of have all of those stories which have been around for about a century. The U.S. also, there's also kind of a cultural and racial aspect to it, which I won't do a lot with. Uh, but the U.S. clearly sees Orientals as being different. They're cunning, they're decadent, they're cowardly all at once. Uh, a textbook from the 18th century said that the Chinese were the most dishonest, low, and thieving people in the world. All right? In the 19th century, the British actually had great interest in China because what were they forcing the Chinese to buy? Opium. The so-called Opium Wars. The British, remember India was a British colony, the British would go to India. Yeah. Um, I don't know how that'll play, but they can deal with it. Can you hear over me? This, they do this. This goes on every week. We, we can edit this out later. Do not use the elevators. Walk to the nearest available exit and evacuate the building. Do not use the elevators. Spielberg doesn't have to put up with this, man. The building fire alarm has been activated. All occupants walk to the nearest available exit and evacuate the building. Do not use the elevators. Walk to the nearest available exit and evacuate the building. Do not use the elevators. Let's all go to the elevators. Fire alarm 
Last week when I was here and this went off, it took about 30 minutes to get the thing shut off. That's what I just said. Okay. All right. I want my time back. (laughs) Take a break. Okay, uh, <laughs> as, I, as I was saying, uh, America's ideas and interest in Asia were very similar today to what they were a century ago. Um, and, and the story of America's role in Asia is full of you know, ideas about markets and commerce and trade and mission and, and so forth. It's the biggest country, in the, China's the biggest country in the world, Japan, uh, a major power. Um, there's also this kind of cultural racial aspect to it where <clears throat> Americans believe that Orientals are cunning and cowardly and decadent. In 1784, late 18th century, a textbook about China said that they were the most dishonest, low, thieving people in the world. In the 19th century, Britain had great interest in China. It was getting opium from India and then forcing the Chinese to buy it. These are the so-called opium wars. And what did the Americans think of that? John Quincy Adams, a guy who I've already uh, quoted approvingly, right, earlier. Adams was a good guy, right? Well, John Quincy Adams also praised England's just war in China. It was a war based on justice. It forced China, John Quincy Adams said, to adopt the Christian precept of open commerce. So the open door wasn't just, it was the Christian, God wanted the Chinese to have to buy opium from the, uh, the British. John Quincy Adams said that China's refusal to accept Western trade practices was an enormous outrage upon the rights of human nature. An enormous outrage upon the rights of human nature. Isn't that wonderful? You couldn't make this stuff up, right? China, Americans said, was also a moral wilderness. This is why you have to send missionaries in. In addition to that, you could also send products in. James Duke, I mean, who James Duke is? Duke University. You've all heard of Duke University. What did Duke do? Cigarettes, right? Yeah, he's the guy who started the uh, RJR, yeah. James Duke was looking at a map of China in 1881, and it hit him. They have already 430 million people. Can you imagine if they start smoking? Right? These are the new opium wars. The same thing's going on today. If you look at American policies in Asia, you know, there's, there's been a decline in smoking here in the United States. Why do you think these tobacco companies continue to pay these billion dollar settlements? Because their profits are all time high. Why is that? Where are they selling this stuff? They're selling it in Asia, especially. In China, in Vietnam, in Thailand, all over, American cigarette companies are flooding and forcing open Asian markets. It's like a new version of the opium wars. So uh, uh, there's also this kind of cross-cultural transfer to a lot of Asians, a lot of Chinese and Japanese start coming to the United States, especially Chinese, to do work. Where do the Chinese play a particularly important role in labor? The railroads, Transcontinental Railroad, built with Chinese uh, uh, coolie worker labor, established Chinatowns. I'm not going to really spend any time on it, but this also leads to a great deal of social tension, especially on the West Coast in California where uh, western towns begin to pass laws excluding Chinese and Japanese workers, uh, not allowing uh, Chinese or Japanese kids to be, uh, you know, uh, educated in, in public schools and so forth, all right? So all of this is happening throughout the 19th century. The United States wants to get access to the markets of China, so much so that it denies China's right to keep British opium out, to keep Indian opium out from Britain. In addition to that, China itself was undergoing some major transformations. The dynasty in China, the Qing dynasty, the Manchus, it's the same thing, was decrepit, really falling apart. And foreigners begin 
flowing in to China to try to get a piece of it because it's huge. You know, already 430 million people. That's a lot of people. All right. So everybody's rushing in to uh, to uh, uh, China, and this leads to a war in 1895 between the Chinese and the Japanese, the Sino-Japanese War in 1895. Okay, this is down there toward the end, Sino-Japanese War. All right. Um, as a result of this, Japan wins a major victory. Japan blows away the Chinese. It's it's a huge rout, and so everybody realizes how weak. China is. So as soon as Japan decisively routes China, what do the other powers do? They dash in. Germany takes Shingdao. You know, you all heard of Shingdao, right? Why do you know what why is that term familiar? Why is that name familiar? Shingdao. Shingdao. Shingdao beer? Never drink Shingdao beer? Chinese beer? Shingdao was a German colony. Kiachao was called at the time. And in 1917, when the, the Japanese took over Shingdao and kicked all foreigners out except for German brewers. That's why you have Shingdao beer today. See what you learn in here? So the Germans take Shingdao. The Russians take Port Arthur. The French take uh, Guangzhou Bay. Uh, the Portuguese take Macau. And the British take the best known of all, which would be Hong Kong, which they only recently relinquished in, in 1997. So China's getting all carved up. Who was excluded from that? Who did I just not mention? The United States, right? Why? Because they don't do that yet. They don't have the capacity to do it. This is why Mahan's talking about a big navy and everything else. So the U.S. doesn't have the capacity to dash in and carve up, help carve up China. But they want a piece. They want a slice. They want to wet their beaks, right? It's kind of like the, the Tony Soprano version of, of, of foreign policy. So, but they can't do it. They don't have the means to do it. All these other countries already have, you know, basically a foothold in the Pacific. The U.S. is still far away, doesn't have a big navy, doesn't even acquire Guam or Hawaii yet, not the Philippines. So finally, after the Spanish-American-Filipino War, what does the U.S. do? They issue, I talked about this before, the open door notes. John Hay issues the open door notes as a way to demand um, access to the markets of China. The open door notes, they're not like the Monroe Doctrine. The U.S. can't say, you all have to stay out of China. They can do that in Latin America. They can't do that in Asia. So it doesn't say that, but what it does is say, we want in. We want to have a free and fair field of commerce. We want an open door where we can get access to these markets, all right? So Hay issues the open door notes in 1899 and another set in 1900, okay? He wants to make Americans have access to the markets of China. At the same time, it's really important, though, to keep China intact. Why? Because everybody's going in there and carving it up. In addition to that, complicating things further, there's also a rebellion going on in China. Does anybody know what that is? The Boxer Rebellion. There's a bunch of young nationalists. And what do the boxers not? Well, the boxers don't like a lot of things. The boxers don't like the Manchus. They don't like the, the, the government. And what else don't they like? Foreigners. They don't want Americans and others and Chinese and, every, I'm sorry, Japanese and Europeans coming in. So, the Boxer Rebellion then is occurring at the same time that Hay issues the open door notes. During the Boxer Rebellion, Russia sent 175,000 troops into Manchuria. Manchuria is in the north of, I'll put a map up later, of, uh, uh, it's in northern China. The, the northern region is called Manchuria. Incredibly rich in resources. Uh, and Russia demanded a commercial monopoly there. Manchuria is very important. And Russia is saying, Manchuria should belong to us. Now, the Americans don't agree with this. That's, that's not the open door, right? The open door would say everybody has access to Manchuria. And if the open door is directed at China in general, it's even more specifically directed at Manchuria because there's minerals and uh, they're going to build a big railroad and there's just all kinds of resources there. So Teddy Roosevelt and John Hay can't really do anything to prevent Russia or anyone else from coming in to Manchuria. But they say that the U.S. has always recognized, they say that the U.S. has always recognized the exceptional position of Russia in Manchuria, but that they want commercial freedom guaranteed to us by the whole civilized world. And again, what is civilization? Markets, commercial freedom, right? It's like, you know, commercial, they're in a lot of business schools, I don't know what they do here, but in a lot of business schools, uh, uh, democracy means commercial liberty, you know, the ability to trade and things like that. So, 
uh, uh, the United States is demanding this open door in China. However, there's one country more important than all others in that region, and who is that? In Asia. Japan. Okay? And Japan has grievances, but Japan also has two advantages, geographical proximity and the military power to back it up. So Japan is particularly upset, not really with the Americans in the open door notes, because those are kind of rhetorical. Japan is particularly upset, though, with which country, do you think? Who's, who's in Manchuria? Russia. So Japan is very upset with Russia's claims on Manchuria. Russia is a naval rival in addition to that. So in February of 1904, Japan launches a surprise attack on Russia at Port Arthur and destroys the entire Pacific fleet, which kind of freaks out the world because you have an Asian country whipping on a big European power. The Russians, we all know and we'll find out in short order, are falling apart even worse than the Chinese were. Now, Teddy Roosevelt was, was kind of happy initially with Japanese success because he didn't want the Russians controlling Manchuria either. But then he begins to fear, Roosevelt believes in white supremacy, remember, a yellow peril in Asia. He's afraid that if the Japanese do this, then they might, you know, kind of get this idea that all of Asia should be in their sphere of influence. This will be what World War II is about. By early 1905, the Japanese were wiping out the Russian Navy. And inside Russia, this was spurring on revolutionary uprisings. There's actually an abortive revolution in 1905 in Russia. The Japanese ask Roosevelt to mediate to end the war. They go to New Hampshire. And everything gets finally worked out. I don't go into the details of the settlement. The United States, as a result, had to recognize the Japanese role in Asia. Now, this is not what the open door is about. The open door doesn't say Japan has the biggest role to play there. The open door should be we're all equal. But what's the reality? The reality is that Japan has defeated the Chinese in 1905, in the 1895, I'm sorry, in the Sino-Japanese War. And then in 1904-1905, it wipes out the Russians in the Russo-Japanese War, which is even more critical because it's a European uh, 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 country. So um, the United States has to recognize Japan's role in Asia. And in fact, in 1904, uh, uh, Japan goes into another Asian country to take over. What, does anybody know what that is? No. Uh, Korea, right? And what does Roosevelt say? Teddy Roosevelt says that the Japanese have to have a relationship of power in Korea, quote, just like we have with Cuba. So Roosevelt can't, you know, he has to back off and say so. And Korea will be a, a, a Japanese colony until World War II. Teddy Roosevelt is afraid that Japan is part of this yellow peril, will stake out its claim throughout the entire continent. So he starts to fortify the Pacific. He fortifies Pearl Harbor and the Philippines. He sends battle fleets on what he calls goodwill cruises into the Pacific, basically gunboat diplomacy, a show force, a way to say to the Japanese, we're getting there. We're growing, we're expanding our navy, we have commercial interest, and soon enough, we will be a rival in the Pacific to you. So the U.S. and the Japanese basically agree that the Pacific will be an open avenue of trade. They will have an open door in the Pacific. They'll respect the uh, uh, integrity of Japanese and American possessions, and they will promise equal opportunities in China. The reality, though, however, is that Japan, of course, will have a major role to play in China. And so this is what, you know, kind of U.S. policy from the early 20th century to December 7th, 1941 is going to be about jockeying for position in the Pacific. The U.S. demanding an open door where it can use its economic strength to gain wealth and prosperity. And Japan, as an Asian country, essentially wanting to take control of the entire continent based on geographic and cultural proximities. Okay, so this is, the, this is what happens. Teddy Roosevelt mediates between the Japanese and Russians, but also doesn't trust them and begins to fortify. <clears throat> William Howard Taft and Philander Knox succeed uh, uh, Roosevelt as president and then Knox as secretary of state. They are big advocates of the open door as well, and they believe that they can use China to kind of play off against Japan. China is very weak, it's decrepit, the Manchus are really in decay. However, potentially it's huge. So they decide to support Chinese nationalism because if, if the nationalists take over China, who's the first country that's going to probably be, you know, kind of acted upon it by the Chinese nationalists? Who would be their main threat? Japan. Japan, right? So they believed that Chinese nationalism could become a counterweight 
to Japan. So they're going to, it's kind of like in Panama, you know, you support countries who are nationalist and who may actually accept ideas you don't believe in because you have the same enemy. So, um, you know, just like the boxers had challenged the Manchus, uh, this had been going on. So uh, 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 there had been this nationalist movement then in China. And um, Teddy Roosevelt didn't think that the Chinese were really capable of developing any kind of an effective resistance, but uh, Taft was so enamored of the China market that he was willing to support the forces of Chinese nationalism. He began to work with one of his uh, American officials, uh, a guy named Willard Strait, and they especially wanted to develop American commercial interests in Manchuria. Right, so the Americans, like the Russians, like the Japanese, were especially interested in Manchuria, northern region of China. And William Howard Taft and Willard Strait and the Department of State officials go to Wall Street. They go to New York bankers and they form a consortium headed by a guy named J.P. Morgan. You've all heard of J.P. Morgan, biggest banker in New York. And they create a consortium. You know what consortium is? It's a group of businesses put together to finance a particular you know, project. In this case, they want to build a railway through Manchuria into China. That's big. That's huge. Right? So the Americans put together this railway consortium, and this is what Taft will refer to as dollar diplomacy. He said, we will replace bullets with dollars. Instead of sending in armies and occupying forces, we're going to send in consortia of bankers. Instead of occupying a country and taking it over, we're going to build stuff there and get profits out of it. All right? So this is part of the American Railway Consortium plan. This is part of the open door for China, right? Take a really quick, like three to five minute break. They're gonna have to just switch over uh, tapes uh, and um,